Chapter 26 Scott Hudson settled back in his seat and opened his notebook. As always, he glanced briefly to the side, two rows to his left, where Julia sat. As always, he sighed. Up front, his teacher began a lesson. We're going to learn about viewpoints today, Mr. Franca said. Cool, Scott thought. He enjoyed the way his teacher was able to take a story apart without killing it. Mr. Franca was definitely a surgeon and not an assassin. In Third Person Limited, Mr. Franca said, we see the world of the story through the eyes, ears, and mind of just one character. We only know what he thinks and observes. Scott was already familiar enough with the concept. He thought about some of the books he'd read that used this viewpoint. In Omniscient Voice, Mr. Franca said, we can flit from person to person. He scanned the rows of students, pleased to see that they were paying attention. It was a good honors class this year. But some readers find that the omniscient viewpoint doesn't allow them to develop a bond with the characters. At times, if handled poorly, it can even be jolting. I'm hungry, Kelly thought. Mr. Frank had discussed other variations of the third-person viewpoint. Then he said, A few books use second person, but this is tough and can be a bit of a gimmick. Sometimes, the writer could suck you right into the character so well that you were almost unaware of the viewpoint. You open the book and start reading. You feel like you're actually in the story. You go right along with it, though you probably agree that the viewpoint can be used as a gimmick. And then there's first person, he said. One of the characters tells the story. I listened as he talked about viewpoint for the rest of the period. It was all pretty interesting. I'd found that with some really good books, I had a hard time remembering what viewpoint they used. As I was leaving class, Mr. Franco waved me up to his desk. I'll need your decision before the end of the month. How about you let me know by the 25th? Sure, I said. No problem. As I spoke those words, my mind searched for any clue to what he was talking about. I desperately needed a dose of omniscience, but his thoughts remained his own. Maybe if I could get him to talk some more, I'd get a hint. You sure you don't need it earlier? No, that will give me plenty of time to gather the materials. Yeah, I guess. Still no real clue. So, the 25th. Sure. I'll make a note. I hovered there, hoping he'd say something else. When he didn't, I headed for the door. I was almost out of the room when he said, Scott? Yeah? He pointed to the wall above the blackboard. I saw a poster that said, April is National Poetry Month. I'd completely forgotten that I was supposed to come up with our topic for that month. You didn't forget, did you? He asked. Of course not. Thank goodness he wasn't omniscient either. March 3rd. It's quiet. Bobby's out somewhere. Mom and Dad went for a drive in the vet, which is actually almost running. Dad's put a ton of work into it. So is Bobby. Mom could hardly squeeze into the passenger seat. It was like watching someone stuff a roll of socks into a paper towel tube. My mind's been stuck on the weirdest thing. The other day, I almost got in a fight with Danny. I'm glad I didn't. Not because I'm afraid, but I was thinking, he's already really unpopular. What if he got so upset about losing a fight that he tried to kill himself? It would be my fault. I should go visit Mouth again. The school finally found a new Spanish teacher. Ms. Fong seemed very nice. She smiled a lot. We communicated with gestures since she didn't appear to understand English. Even so, I was happy to see her because I was getting tired of doing calisthenics in class and hearing Mr. Cravuto shout, Suck it up, Bambinos! Nobody had the guts to tell him that Bambinos wasn't Spanish. I went to the town library after school and spent a couple of hours trying to figure out what we should study in English next month. We'd already covered everything I could think of. On the way home, I stopped at the corner store to look at magazines. As I browsed through the rack of comic books, I got a great idea, but I figured there was no way Mr. Franco would go for it. I didn't get back to see Mouth until the end of the week. He'd finally healed enough to talk. Hi, he said when I walked in. That's the shortest sentence you've ever uttered, I thought. Damn, look at me. I was still making jokes. I truly sucked. He didn't talk much. His voice was kind of raspy. Maybe it hurt. Or maybe he was all talked out. I wanted to ask him why. Instead, I said, you feeling okay? He shrugged, I guess. 
I waited for him to say more. But he just lay there, looking kind of spacey. Maybe they had him on some kind of drugs. But I had to know. Why'd you do it? I asked. Why not? Because you can't, I said. It's cheating, mouth. That's what it is. Cutting in line. Or cutting out of line. You can't do that. You've got to stick with it. I stopped. In my ears, my voice was starting to take on the meaningless drone of Mr. Cravuto when he urged us to dig deep and stick it out for another laugh. Come on, baby, suck it up. Hang in there. Pump those legs, you gutless losers. Keep it going. Nobody likes me, Mouth said. I didn't bother replying with the obvious lie. Oh, don't say that. You've got tons of friends. Nobody likes me either, I said. I cope. He shook his head. Lots of people like you. Right, sure. I wasn't there to argue with him. But he knew as well as I did that if I threw a party for all of my friends, we could fit in a phone booth and still have room for pony rides and a moon bounce. Mitch was a little more than a memory. Patrick was in Texas and on his way to Japan. Kyle spent all his time with the wrestlers, even though the season was over. I hoped we were still friends, but I didn't really know. According to the numbering system... I was presently a member of the Zero Musketeers. I dropped down into the chair next to Mouth's bed. Let's face it, with a few exceptions, nobody likes anybody. He nodded. That was a grim statement, and I didn't really believe it. I mean, I hoped that deep in my heart I didn't believe it. Half the time I didn't know what I believed. But at least this got Mouth thinking about how his loneliness, or whatever it was that drove him too far wasn't unique. We all suffered. And I guess we all had good times, too. Man, if every person who ever felt lonely killed himself, the world would be littered with corpses. And far lonelier. When I was getting up to leave, I finally asked him the question that had been haunting me. You remember the dance? Mouth nodded. You weren't going to ask any girls to dance, but I talked you into it. I paused, trying to find the right words. Did that have anything to do with what happened? He shook his head. No way. You were being nice. Nobody else in the whole school cared at all. So I didn't make you do anything? I made myself do it, he said. I nodded and headed out of the room. When I reached the hallway, Mouth called after me. Scotty! What? Cheer up. I'll try. Even if Mouth said that it wasn't my fault, I still felt that everyone in the school shared the blame. All of us had done our part to crush him. Monday morning, when I got in the car with Wesley, I decided to speak up. You shouldn't take other people's mo lunch money, I told him. Why not? Well, how'd you like it if someone took your money? He laughed. Fat chance. Imagine if you weren't very strong. He frowned for a couple seconds, then shook his head. I can't imagine that. I searched for some way to get him to understand. You have any little brothers? Nope. What if you had a little brother? Think how he'd feel if someone took his money. I'd kick the guy's butt. Sure you would, after you found out. But think how your little brother would feel while it was happening. He was quiet for the rest of the ride. But when we pulled into the parking lot, he said, I guess it would kind of suck. It would definitely suck. I hoped this was a sign that the school had just become a little le bit less stressful for the small and the weak. By then, the jokes had pretty much stopped. It was like nearly everyone had forgotten about Mouth, or like he'd never even existed. In a way, as far as Zenger High was concerned, I guess he'd succeeded in dying. I wondered how small a ripple I'd leave if I vanished. A couple days later, I got a letter from him. He thanked me for being such a good friend, which made me feel really rotten. He wouldn't be coming back. His parents were sending him to a different school. When I told Lee about the letter, she said I should feel good that Mouth took the trouble to write me. But I never liked him, I said. It doesn't matter, she said. You were nice to him. At least, nicer than most of the kids, right? I guess. So what's harder, being nice to someone you like or being nice to someone you don't like? 
I saw what she meant, but it didn't make me feel any better. March 15th. I just got back from the dance. I think they purposely spaced them just far enough apart, so I always forget how little fun it is to stand around drinking soda and eating potato chips while other people pair up and flail in the air. Other than that, I had a great time. It was a St. Patrick's Day dance, though. That holiday actually falls on a Sunday this year. If you've been paying attention, you'll spot the discrepancy. And also a vocabulary word. Notice anything that doesn't fit? Here's a hint. Think about Christmas and Easter. I'll tell you the answer in a day or two. In the meantime, here's a list for you. Things that happen so far apart that you forget how bad they are. School dances. Dentist appointments. Hernia tests. Award shows. Chicken goulash in the cafeteria. I spent another week looking for ideas for English class. Still no luck. The deadline had arrived. I went up to see Mr. Frank at his desk before class. So what you got, Scott? Something hot? He flashed a grin to let me know he was aware of the painful way he'd phrased the question. Two words popped out of the vacuum created by my panic. Comic books. I backed up a step, expecting a lecture on taking things seriously. <gasps> Mr. Frank had glanced over at the cabinets where he kept the books. Good choice. Really? He nodded. At least I won't have to scrounge around and dig up materials. I was afraid you'd pick something like advertising slogans or bumper stickers. You'd let us study stuff like that? If it's written in, the, in English, we can study it. Even knock-knock jokes are worth studying, not to mention shaggy dog stories. But I like your choice. Besides, we'll be do doing slogans for a day or two next month. I wandered back to my desk. On the way, I thought up a dozen other things I could have suggested. But I was happy we were doing comics. The center on the basketball team, Terry, said hi to me in the hall when he went by. He probably had me mixed up with someone else. But maybe I looked familiar to him since I'd gone to almost all the games last season. I'd never received a nod from so far above my head. Some of the basketball players had started saying hi to me too. Some of the baseball players had started saying hi to me too. I wondered whether it was because I'd written about how well the team was doing. Even better, this girl on the track team smiled at me. I was actually having fun with the articles. Not like before, where I did all that crazy stuff for football. That was fun too, though in a different way. Back then, I was trying as hard as I could to avoid writing a sports story. Now, I was trying to write the best sports story possible. Last week, I'd written about how the other team couldn't seem to get warmed up. When I was doing my rewrite, I changed it to, their engine was running, but it kept sputtering, like a lawnmower tackling the first grass of the season. Maybe that was a bit much, but I felt pretty good about it. As fun as it all was, I was looking forward to a break. Wednesday was a half day. After that, no school for a week. No games to cover either. There were only three things I wanted to do. Sleep, nap, and doze. In other news, Miss Fong was gone. Adios, muchachos. Mr. Cravuto was back. We took two breaks for push-ups. March 31st. Happy Easter. When you're old enough to walk, I'll go outside and hide eggs for you to find in pathetically obvious places. Easter is by far the best holiday for chocolate. Halloween is probably second. They have little else in common. It's also spring break. College kids make a big deal out of the whole thing. They go to Mexico or Florida and party for a solid week. You can see it all on MTV. But you know what? I have this sinking feeling that it's just like the dances. If I went to Cancun, I'd be standing in a corner watching other kids have fun. Though I guess instead of potato chips, I'd be eating tortilla chips. Wow, I just realized how pathetic that sounds. I don't want you to think that I feel sorry for myself all the time or that I don't expect to have any fun. Things are okay. Well, mostly okay. Did I mention that we have rehearsal every evening during vacation? Half the time the rest of the crew sits around while I drag the sets all over the place. Show business sucks. Speaking of Easter, did you figure out what's weird about the St. Patrick's Day dance? Here's the thing. They can't have a Christmas or an Easter event, but they can have one named after a saint. Actually, two, if you include Valentine's Day. As for what all this means, 
I'm clueless.